share their poems with us and then Abuja, Kalyani and Srinata who will be uh, sharing their poems with us. And we also have Kavyala Vaishishtya where specific poets come and talk about their forms of poetry and all of that. It's going to be interesting like all of the times. So uh, I request Preet Kona, who is also a fellow coordinator of Kavyala and who's a doctoral scholar at NIAS, to please introduce the speakers for the day. Over to you, Preet. Thank you so much, Meera. Uh, very warm welcome to one and all. Uh, and uh, I'm very excited. Hello, Dr. Uh, Ahuja. Uh, I would, I would uh, start by introducing today's poets. Uh, the first uh, poet on panel today is Dr. Anand Ahuja. He hails from Vadodara, Gujarat. Uh, he's an interventional cardiologist by profession. Uh, he says, claiming matters of heart as both passion and profession. Uh, he's currently the director of Rhythm Heart Institute at Vadodara. Uh, apart from romantic poetry, he also stories. Uh, we welcome you, sir. Uh, after Dr. Anand Ahuja, on the panel, we have uh, Kalyani. Kalyani hails from Tavananthapuram, Kerala. She is currently pursuing a master's in philosophy at the University of Delhi. When she is not immersed in the world of words, you can find her singing or painting up abstracts. She uses a pen name, uh, that's Quitch. And a few publications to her credit. And uh, the last uh, poet for the evening would be uh, Sri Nahata. He's currently pursuing his doctoral degree in Sanskrit at the University of Oxford. He specializes in Sanskrit philosophy and enjoys composing Sanskrit verses. Uh, thank you so much, one and all, for being here this evening. I would uh, request Dr. Ananda Hoja to start with this recital. Uh, sir, do you want me to share the screen? Uh, yes, please. Uh, you know, I would like to share my written poetry also. Can you please allow me screen sharing? Uh, so I, you, could you share? Your I'm screen. doing. The, are you able to see the screen, sir? Yes, I can see it. Perfect. Right. Okay. Sure. Fair enough. So. Uh, Thank you, first of all, uh, Kavyadap and Vaividya for uh, giving me this opportunity to share with you. I won't say my poetry, but these are uh, feelings that I co that come directly from my heart, which I put on paper. Uh, thank you for acknowledging that they are worth uh, discussing or uh, talking about. Uh, these poems are uh, from my collection of uh, romantic poems called Dusty Memories Unfinished. And this uh, book is likely to come out uh, most likely by next month. So I'd, recite, I'd like to recite three or four poems from this. Uh, the first poem is called First. Uh, the first poem, this is a poem about first love. And first love is associated with a lot of contradictory uh, experiences. Some are happy, some are sad. Experiences of excitement and dejection, thrill and longing. Everything that is mixed up that, com that constitutes first love. And although most of our uh, first love, everyone's first love remains unrequited, uh, it still remains the most precious memory in our heart all our lives. So uh, this poem deals with, you know, what are the different contradictory experiences that one has? And towards the end, one's condition becomes like a katipatan. You know, it is neither sailing, neither anchored, and it just keeps floating in a state of suspended uh, animation in an uncharted direction. Uh, this is what the poem is about. So the poem goes like this. <clears throat> first was the love, first was the sight, first was the time I cried all night. The burden on the heart, the weight on the soul, first was the moment nothing seemed right. First was the letter, first was the song, first was the call, the wait so long. The first shower of rain, the first leaf of spring, first was the time I quit right for the wrong. Here wrong is changing the conventional. Before the first love, we had a conventional traditional life of a young boy or an adolescent, which we quit for something called seemingly wrong in society. So first was the time I quit right for the wrong. The first meet of eyes, the magic of the wand, the first soft caress, I took her hand. The first leap of joy, I wrote her name and first was the sorrow, the tide washed the sand. The first waits anxiety, the first sight's courtesy, the first dream's fantasy, 
the first touch's ecstasy, the first letter's legacy, the first date's secrecy, the first feels mystery, the first love's policy. First was the pleasure, first was the pain, first soft comfort, first hard disdain, first rise of desire, first dip of despair, first wisdom of life, first love insane. That's the first wisdom which comes after, you know, uh, the first love does not work out about the insanity of first love. And this is the final crux, the climax. First solitary tear in the first solitary night and a solitary me in the chilly frost bite. And in the first hazy, unaddressed sky, a first unsailed, unanchored, solitary kite. Thank you. This was the poem about first love, which I feel very special about. I hope you also liked it. Uh, I'll go to my uh, next poem. The next poem is my most favorite poem. It's called Dusty Memories Unfinished, and it also happens to be the title of my book. Uh, memories of our past love, they remain very special and they remain dormant. They remain buried in some deep recesses of the heart, but they are not dead. They are always alive and they resurface whenever you dust them. Those memories, those footprints always remain in the heart. Unfinished is a pun here. It has two meanings. It is unfinished because the memories are incomplete. The love did not find completion. And it is unfinished because it is undestroyed. The memories, although incomplete, they still prevail. So unfinished has two meanings here. I have used a lot of imagery in this poem. Uh, it has four stanzas. The first stanza talks about what it was then. Like life was rosy. It was like a garden, all flowers and blooms and nectar and butterflies and moths. And now what happens? The same colorful rose becomes a wrinkled bud which remains buried in pages of memory, which sometimes comes out when you turn those pages. And as you turn out, as you see that rose, that crimpled rose, uh, you get tears in your eyes and your heart wails. And in the third stanza, you again, I go back to then, when my eyes see the feet of my beloved coming, my heart leaps with joy. It's a dance of my soul, as if the spring is coming, as if uh, crickets and sparrows chirp. And now what remains is just a dried twig of stem. Although it is dried, it still supports a new creeper. And the memories, the footprints of our memories still remain buried in my heart all through my life. This is what the poem is about. So the poem goes like this. <clears throat> a marigold by the mossy green, half hidden from the eye. A marigold by the mossy green, half hidden from the eye. A dewdrop sparkle shines a proud, the sunbeam from the high. The elegant folds, the nectar pure, bending of the bud shy. Breeze with the fragrant sweet, catches a moth and butterfly. This was then. And now, now a wrinkled, crimpled bud between the pages of memory lie. Buried in time, turning leaves, once comes forth, beholds the eye. A drop of pearl. A drop of pearl drips down the cheek, the misty heavy eye. A crimson dot trickles dead, the heart gives a sigh. A crimson dot is a drop of blood. A crimson dot trickles dead, the heart gives a sigh. Again, going back to then. Ankles tinkle, bangles jingle, the ringing of her coming. Crickets harp, sparrows chirp, onset of the spring. Hopes arise, desires awake, the dead heart starts a beating. The dance of joy, the play of soul, these eyes, those feet are mating. So that is spring for me. And now, just a twig of stem, broken brown, stands tall by the green, gives hand to a fresh twine, her embracing the burns. Misty lakes, heavy legs. Misty lakes are my tear-filled eyes and heavy legs are tired legs. I keep dragging my life as times change, seasons change, lives change. So misty lakes, heavy legs, seasons change, times fly so mean. The footprints, the footprints still lie deep the place, the sand the wind upturns. The footprints still lie deep the place, the sand the wind upturns. That was really, really special for me. I hope uh, you also feel the similar connection. Uh, thank you.
and i come to another romantic poem and this poem is called just nothing you know uh, we have lot of old memories of uh, some closed ones spend some special moments even friends who used to be so close to us we virtually shared every single thing but as time changes our lives change and we move away and we don't even get to see each other though even those people who always shared everything with each other however memorabilia associated with these memories they sometimes remain stuffed in some closet some cupboards some drawers and once while dusting or cleaning they come out they spring out and they immediately take us back to those golden moments and those moments give us tears in our eyes and smile on our lips both at the same time for seemingly no apparent reason and if there is a bystander who watches us what he would ask what happened we would have tears in our eyes smile on our lips but we would have just nothing to say so that's a very uh, simple poem uh, the poems uh, goes like this times immortal waited for none days pass and years go past memories shun moments however close elude fast you move away from that loved one worlds apart once who cared lives people the change spared none now not once now meet who always shared those who always shared always close now don't even meet or don't even see each other but the little heart always cherishes precious moments in close confines memories that make you sad in happy flourishes and turn you happy at sad times memories are special they can make you happy in sad times and then they can make you sad they can give you tears even in happy times the heart has all those moments that chase moments that always feel something the heart has all those moments that chase moments that always feel something they ask seeing you straight in the face they just look into your eyes directly those moments and eyes wet lips smile and you say just nothing you have nothing to say so this is about just nothing you know when you are suddenly stuck by memorabilia associated with old memories they just spring us back so that was uh, another romantic poetry and uh, now moving away from a romantic poem i come to my next poem this is a poem called jar of life it's a philosophical poem where the jar a jar full with a uh, liquid or water is compared with the transience of life this poem is written from the point of view of a drop a drop which is there in the jar and when it is full when the jar is full there's lot of twisting turning lot of motions the brownian motion so to say and every, life is all party uh, however slowly some uh, drops around this drop go on reducing however i do not realize i or the drop does not realize it continues to party initially in ignorance and later in arrogance it's only when a lot of drops are missing and only a few are left that this drop realizes that this jar of life is not intact it is leaking it is leaky at the bottom where it leaks out no one knows not only that it is leaky it also is a conical in shape it is not a cylindrical uniform but gradually even times uh, even the distance even the space becomes squeezed and what happens is that the decline because of this becomes very rapid and it's only when uh, the uh, you know the drop reaches the nadir the bottom of the jar and is just about to leak out that it realizes the futility of uh, you know superficialness and realizes that every moment is to be lived fullest you need not worry about the past you need not worry about the future live every single moment as it comes so this is what the jar of life is about uh, i begin <clears throat> a big jar of life so full where never was a moment dull twisting turning swooshing swirling times passed fast never a lull unmindful of the ways of the jar heedless of others afar dance and music played all along life was a party all moon and star everything is full now however with passing moments begun celebrations continued all alone i still continued celebrations a few among my many a miss now a few drops started missing however 
ignorance carried wisdom didn't show a few among my many a miss ignorance carried uh, ignorance carried wisdom didn't show <clears throat> sometime later did i realize the pace of the downward slide now more a miss arrogance on picked more pace on the downward glide now the descent became more rapid more steep space now squeezed decline rapid life spent reflected seemed vapid vapid is bland now just a few drops around left over moments once rocking seemed insipid like tasteless everything seemed futile now when the decline was rapid and i reached the bottom looking ahead was frightening to think where those before vanished in a blink the drops before me they had just disappeared and to think that this would be my fate also was quite frightening so looking ahead was frightening to think where those before vanished in a uh, blink finding others behind uh, just a minute sir yeah uh, finding others behind at my trailing rear mindful i got about my being lives here now now the realization comes lives here this moment in the now not relishing the past not waiting the row be complete here till it lasts and toil for the next and mindfully so mindfully spend each moment which is precious now enjoy your now have a blast live fullest the moments till they last and smile a prettier world awaits the other side not really aghast we didn't worry when we came to this world so why worry when we move on to the next world and certainly it would also be a very pretty world just like this one is so don't really have to worry about it now we are at the bottom of the jar turbining at the jar nadir nadir is bottom turbining at the jar nadir just the two of us linger now only two drops left waiting now for my turn to come perhaps now perhaps later <clears throat> what happens the next who would know what happens the next who would know faith resolves yet a shiver does flow i keep my faith but still i shiver with fear what was a jar is but now just a drop of life that's all to show what was a jar is but now just a drop of life that's all to show thank you very much uh, i hope you liked uh, some of my poems from my collection i shared mix uh, one was a philosophical and two three were uh, romantic poetry is about nostalgia and memories thank you very much thank you so much sir that was really beautiful such simple words but and no complicated uh, analogies no complicated words, no nothing complex there but very beautifully you had uh, uh mentioned to us uh, so many you brought us so many memories and it was really beautifully done and preet was uh, just mentioning that you are in uh, into really like that to hear as a crimson dot who is i think it really made my day so uh, beautiful beautiful recitation so we'll take more questions and all of that later by the end of the session i'm sure there'll be many more comments to come so over to the next poet so uh, kalyani if you're here yes i am hi hello so yeah you can go ahead with your recitation okay uh but uh, before i begin uh, i just i would like to say something um so a few months ago i uh, presented a paper on um, an unknown perspective on poems and uh, what i actually wanted to say is that when i did that research my aim was to let others know that there is no one meaning to a poem and everyone is free to interpret it any way they want so i just want to tell you all that when i'm reading out this poem you all are free to interpret it the way you want and you can all uh, write down um, what you felt about the poem in one word or a, or one sentence and you can later tell me towards the end of the session so the first poem is named the liquid now uh, the poem is a little on the heavier side of um, 
um, of society. I mean, it's it's a uh, it's a little um, how do I uh, put it? I I couldn't really put it because there are so many uh, sides to this poem, but I would like to categorize it as a poem that uh, highlights the violence against women, and uh, that's what I've tried to portray in it. So here it goes. I remember trembling, my finger cut. Ma was there, healed she did the tingle, but she could not put to rest my fear of that dreaded red liquid. It's called blood, laughed Ma, I hear. But that is all and no more, for I see it oozing, oozing out my finger, dripping to the floor, as though it would return into a human being another, my wild thoughts feared the word, so menacing, blood. My first encounter was with the liquid, I called, that took off over my body. And in due time, I learned this menacing, thickened blood could kill me, a knife away, and it would ooze, ooze through my body, sucking the very life out of me. And older I grew, blood turned my companion. Why? I learned. It did take my life alone. It took lives. It gave lives alone. Secretly, wary of it, slithering and sliding inside me, my wild thoughts ran and whispered, what if it churned within just to kill you? And Ma heard my story. Crazy, she said it was. She laughed again, just like the very first time. I remembered she'd healed me. That moment, a shock wave of triumph, realization dawned on me, and I knew Ma could heal it, Ma could save, and only Ma could stop it. So I inched closer and closer. I was so close, Ma became my skin and soul, and I was shielded, guarded from the deadly menace, the liquid I still address. My weaknesses I never showed, it never saw. Wary of me it was, I rose strong again. Ma was right to laugh, and so I laughed too. More a scoff than a laugh. Bathed in pride and protected glory, I began to be the menace. Ma never saw it, neither did I. One day I reached home, a happy soul and glowing skin. And I saw my very own skin and soul trembling. Ma, I whispered, weary tears in her eyes, her beautiful, youthful face stained, her dignity tainted. I held her tight, so tight, fearing she might be gone. Blessed was I, she pointed a finger to the shadows. I stared into nothingness till it shone. My eyes were wide in fear again, the first time all over the same, but I trembled not, and I stood up. I stared hard to understand when fear took me by the hand, pulling me back, stumbling me. The liquid that once oozed out my finger to the floor, now a monster I saw red and menace hidden in a smile. Its skin oozed, so did its mouth. Reaching for Ma, I knew what to do. So I stepped forward, surrendered. It reached for me instead. A wicked smile adorned my face and I drank it back in, trapped inside me. This blood you told me about is salty, Ma. I wiped the corner of my lip stain. The liquid, a menace no more. I was in power. You are unharmed, Ma. Trust in me. My beady eyes smiled. Scott. And uh, my next poem, I'll just. My next poem is named Unlike. So this is basically written. Um, I portray the LGBTQI community. I'm an ally, I'm a member, and I feel like it's for all those people out there who need to have a voice for themselves, who need someone speaking for them, and for anybody who feels different from other people. 
be it their sexuality, their personality, the way they think, the way they act. So here it goes. Unlike, you stare me down and look away disgusted as though I am unbearable to be looked at. Your judgment seeping into my walls, a murmur to many. I brush it off my soul like settling dust, not a care in the world. My sweaty palms tell a different story, residual shame coursing through my trembling body. My aching, beating heart weeps in silent surrender. I shush it to sleep with false condolences. I said I hold torch to light while darkness drinks me in. I preached bravery when your haunting eyes followed me on day's end. But I ask, why? Why does my essence shake you? Why does my truth horrify? Did the ground give way? Did the earth quake? Do your sheets hold my words in whispers, creeping up to you? Your answer spells no. So leave me be. Your hate does not hold me hostage. I have broken free of these shackles you made for me. Your whims shan't be answered. I am a natural. I am me. Touching and very, very expensive. Am I audible, people? Like, great. There is some network issues, Mira. I'm not sure. Yeah. I say. You can hear. Uh, uh, Kalyani, is she audible to you? Uh, her voice keeps breaking off in the middle. Oh, okay. Very sorry, guys. Preet, can you just take over? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, not an issue. Thank you so okay. much, Kalyani. I think really daunting and very poignant. I think there is so much to. Look in and reflect. Uh, absolutely beautiful. I loved them. Uh, before we get into, we'll have a discussion where everybody would contribute. Now I would request the last uh, poet of today's evening, Shreen Hatha. One second, let me unmute. I'm sorry, I'm looking for... I request, yeah, I request for an unmotion. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, thank you, Dr. Anand and Kalyani. I really love both of your poetry. Very different. Uh, Dr. Anand's poetry was so moving and touching, uh, whereas I felt Kalyani's poetry was so dramatic and so, so narrative and so powerful as well. So before I begin, I'd like to really thank my uh, guru and supervisor, Divakar Acharyaji. So he's a Shukla Yajurvedi from Nepal, and he's the Spalding Professor of Eastern Religions and Ethics at Oxford. So whatever little I know of Sanskrit is because of him. So I would say, Yadatra sadhu shastra stats khalitam yatta deva me. So whatever is good and beautiful in my poems is because of my teacher. And whatever is wrong is only because of me. So with that uh, beginning, so why write poetry in Sanskrit? So I mean, uh, there are many languages we can write in and every language has its own distinctive flavor. But the reason I try to write poetry in Sanskrit is the following. And these reasons may be different for different people. So I feel that it's a very beautiful language. It's a very grammatically perfect language and the literary possibilities are immense. So as I think Professor Madhav Deshpande was saying in one of his lectures that it's a word factory. You can build up such an amazingly large vocabulary in Sanskrit. Then there's something called shlesha, which is punning, which is possible in Sanskrit at a scale which is not possible in any other language because every word in Sanskrit has so many different meanings. And I feel that Sanskrit is inherently a language for poetry. And my reason for thinking that is because even in our tradition, even when you were doing mathematics or philosophy, you wrote in verses. So if you know, for instance, Aryabhata, he wrote Aryabhatiyam, one of the most important mathematical treatises in history, but very few people know that it's entirely in verse in the Arya meter. So even when you were doing mathematics and philosophy, poetry was the minimum that you needed to know. And versification was a part of the tradition. However, I think the more interesting question is how do you write poetry in Sanskrit? So I'm not someone who's had the uh, good fortune of learning Sanskrit since my childhood. I've only been learning it for around three or four years. 
Uh, and plus the literary tradition is so vast. So it's a 3000 year history, even conservatively. So you feel the burden of tradition, like how do you find your own voice? And so my approach to writing is basically this. So I try to write in classical meters, uh, just like uh, Dr. Shankar Rajaraman advises, because I feel that they have a certain rhythm and melodic beauty. And if we can come up with new meters in the present, that's also good, but we have to come up with something that's equally beautiful and only then substitute the classical meters. Secondly, I try to utilize the literary conventions uh, unique to Sanskrit. So I believe that every poetic tradition has its own imaginative conventions. And if you want to write in that language, we should try to utilize those unique conventions. So utilize the classical meters, utilize the literary conventions, but then try to say something new, obviously, because if you're saying exactly what Kalidasa said already, chances are your verses will fail in comparison because you can never express yourself as beautifully and as perfectly as Kalidasa. So utilize the meters as well as the uh, uh, literary conventions to say something new. So uh, starting with my verses, all of my verses are single verses which can be read on their own. So I'll read a verse in Sanskrit and then give an English translation. So the first set of verses is in a meter called Shardula Vikriditam, literally the play of the tiger. Uh, it's 19 syllables per quarter. And initially my verses focus on the theme of love. So in Sanskrit poetry, there's a literary convention. Uh, something which we call Kavi Samayaha, uh, that the cloud is the lover and the lightning, uh, Tadit in Sanskrit or Vidyut and Bijli in Hindi, is his beloved. So this is a literary convention which I've adopted for my verse and tried to imagine something new, which I, I at least I haven't read in earlier authors. So here it goes. Kridartham taditaghano jaladharo lokashrutau durdinam Gadhaika kirudat priya virahito varsho chyate manushaihi Sampurna drati mishrana drudhasukhi ji mutana shobhu vi Jnyatum kopina hikshamo krudaya sat kama tura praninaha. So the translation A cloud fills himself with water to play with his beloved lightning. It's a cloudy day, proclaimed the people on earth. Separated from his beloved, the cloud weeps in solitude. It's raining, proclaimed the people on earth. Fully merged with his beloved, the cloud is blissful. The cloud has disappeared, proclaimed the people on earth. Truly, no one can understand the heart of a lovesick person. So this is something uh, in Sanskrit, which we call Arthantara Nyasaha. So you take an example, like I've taken the cloud and the lightning, and then you make a general point about people not understanding the hearts of lovers. So the second verse I'm going to uh, recite uh, uses a little bit of that punning possibility of Sanskrit, which I was saying. So in this verse, I use the word Rambha, which has two meanings that I use. So firstly, it can refer to a celestial apsara. Secondly, it can refer to a banana plant. I know it seems crazy that the same word can refer to both, but yeah. Rambhaya Vrajitor Janaya Gagane Lubdohi Kame Shubhihi Kankshanam Laghumo Muditi Manasa Purtim Drudham Kalpayan Rambhayam Purusho Javena Patito Bhagnanga Kama Sakrut Samsare Vitate Yateshtamiha Yal Labdham Tathanaiva Tat. So translation, struck by the arrows of the god of love, Kamadeva, a man travels in the sky to acquire the celestial damsel Rambha. Imagining the immediate satisfaction of all his desires, he rejoices. Then suddenly he falls down from the sky on a banana plant, Rambha, his limbs and desires shattered. Truly in this illusory world, one never obtains what one wants in the way one wants it. Another verse in the same meter. Samdhya yam bahuvashyate parabhrutah kanta vyavacched dhir. Vyotad dhvanta vivarta bhishita mana surya osra pushtim lashan. Veena shabda kalam tathapi virutam swantam mamahladate. Mahatmyam prakrute raho parasukham kleshe pidhatte nisham. So slight change of theme, you could say it's about nature now. So at dusk, the cuckoo cries out, worried about being separated from his beloved, frightened by the transformation of light into darkness, longing for the nourishment of the sun's rays. 
even this distressed call sweet like the sound of the veena gladdens my heart oh the greatness of nature suffering to make others happy so the next verse again utilizes one of these kavi samayas an interesting feature of sanskrit is that all of these birds are said to have certain properties which are probably biologically not true but they are very imaginative and fascinating so the next verse makes use of two such birds so one bird is the chakravakaha so these are the paradigmatic lovers the male and female chakravakas in sanskrit poetry and they are said to be separated during the night and they are united at dawn that's a convention and then there's another bird called the chataka bird which is said to survive by feeding on raindrops from clouds so these are the two things you need to know in order to understand the next verse आसन्नद्रुमकुंज शीत पवने पद्माकरे विस्फुटे शर्वरियामकंदमसुरभौ चक्र प्रभातोत्सुक भास्वदीधितापिते विजलदे यदवामचातक कांक्षन सतम संवदाहमुभिते प्रिये कस्तव in a blossoming lotus pond with wind cooled by the nearby trees and creepers on a night perfumed by the wine like nectar of flowers a chakravaka bird eagerly awaits dawn in a waterless desert on the other hand scorched by the rays of the sun a chataka bird awaits the darkness of death tell me o oh beloved which of the two birds am i in your heart so the next set of verses are in a different meter it's a uh, shikharini so it's a very famous meter which was used by bhava bhuti hi it's actually quite difficult to write in uh, i feel because there are many light syllables in uh, uh, which come in a row and in sanskrit whenever you decline something it becomes a heavy syllable so it's a bit tricky but now the theme shifts to nature and the first verse is a sort of inspirational verse you could say सुबस्तत्व भृगु परिसरे तालतरुवे पव चंडे खगपति विकारापेतोंते क्षितलपतूल इव च सदव भूयासम विपदी विहिताया क्वचिदी फर्म इन द बिग्निंग like a coconut tree on the edge of a precipice fearless in the middle like an eagle amidst a violent storm unchanged at the end like a cotton wick falling on the ground thus may i face any adversity that befalls me so the next verse as uh, as i said i study philosophy which is much more boring than this so i mean uh, one of the things that's common in philosophy in ancient india they believe that there are five elements in the universe so nyaya sutra says पृथिव्यापस्तेजो वायुराकाशमिथिभूतानी क्षेत्रेव सदा शांत शयन समीर क्षिप्रा वग्दी जलमेवौष्ठा मृतरस सुरूपे शून्य तेखमे हृदय पूरयति कह लाइक द ब्राइट फ्लेम ऑफ अ रेजिंग फायर एट नाइट योर गेस द बिलवेड्स गेस डिस्ट्रॉयज डार्कनेस like the immeasurable earth your large breasts provide a resting place for the weary your words are as, are as sharp and swift as the wind your lips taste like the heavenly water so the four elements yet o oh beautiful lady who can fill your heart a heart which is as empty as space itself as empty as akasha itself in the sanskrit in other words same meter kayoschet stri pum so उदधितटवत्काय मिलनम कदाचित कांतार्थम सरित इव सिंधौ विलयनम क्वचित प्रेम्ये काकी पुलिनमेव कामे पिजलधौ नुमोन्योन्या भिन्नौ सलिलधिक संधा विवरते 
the so some sort of nature and love mixed into one which i think is kind of common in sanskrit poetry so the meeting of some lovers is temporary and physical like the meeting of the ocean with the sandy beach sometimes a lover gives up everything for his beloved like the dissolution of the river in the ocean a lover feels alone in some kinds of love like an island in the middle of a vast ocean yet i only praise the lovers who are mutually inseparable in their passion like the ocean and the sky in the horizon so one of the things that's quite striking about sanskrit uh, literature reading it just as uh, someone curious is that it has a very optimistic attitude to life i would say uh, unlike uh, what you might think based on samsara karma rebirth and all of that actually in sanskrit poetry people really enjoy life and they really enjoy it and see the beauty in everything and so i try to capture that spirit in the next verse uh, which is also on the theme of nature aranyam pratyushe harenapati prushthe picharasi vihayo madhyahne trunashikharam akramyam rushasi nishavaktre sheshe shashadharakarai pushkaradale krume kshudra hote dinacharitam ashcharya janakam seated on the lion's back you roam the forest at dawn climbing the mountain like grass you touch the sky at midday cooled by the moon's rays you sleep on the lotus petal at night your daily routine amazes me o oh, tiny worm so it's about a worm's life and even that is very amazing if you just look in the right way so that's it thank you so much thank you thank you so much shinahata and uh, shankar sir if you are around maybe you are the best person to make any kind of comments on shinahata's uh you know not so much into sanskrit although we did really certainly enjoy your poems nahata so shankar sir if you'd like to say something yeah uh am i audible yes yes uh thank you uh, nahata ji uh i have read a few few of your poems few of your verses uh, on twitter but uh, never got to hear so many verses from you i never knew that you composed so many verses and uh, most of the verses that you or all the verses were muktakas today that you recited and uh, metrical in nature which uh, uh, which i to like i to like metrical poetry and so you uh, you use basically the shardula vikrita and the shikharini uh, chandas and you also brought out the importance of the kavi samayas um uh, do you repeat means i wanted to ask you whether you repeated to use these uh, kavi samayas in your poetry and uh, uh, what is the range of the kavi samayas that you use and uh, do you think kavi the usage of kavi samayas uh, uh, makes poetry a little artificial because uh, most of these uh, poetic conventions i remember actually an instant uh, long back uh, when i uh, i had to give a talk on the use of kavi samayas by bana bhatta and uh, somebody after the talk uh, commented uh, that we should uh, probably conduct some scientific experiments to find out if these kavi samayas were true uh, to find out whether the uh, whether the chakora can actually drink in uh, moonlight and whether the hamsa can actually uh, actually separate uh, milk from water and uh, i found it very funny um, people from other uh, sanskrit disciplines don't seem to understand that these kavi samayas are used for a purpose and there is no sign these are not scientific in nature so uh, what is your take on these kavi samayas and how many kavi samayas do you means, uh, do you use them regularly uh, and how did you practice writing uh, chandobaddha poetry basically so and of all your verses the one verse which i liked the most was this verse on the panchabhutas um, uh, with the panch in the end and it reminded me of kalidasa's one of uh, a verse that was that is ascribed to kalidasa where he um, praises a girl uh, in the initial three lines saying that uh, all her limbs are created out of uh, flowers her face with face out of lotus her lips out of bandhu jeeva etc but ends saying that uh, how is it that the creator having fashioned all your limbs with flowers has fashioned your heart with a stone so um, i i would like to uh, know your uh, take on kavi samayas especially yeah so this uh, kavi samayas i think are for me i don't use them 
in all my verses. So if like the verse about the cuckoo bird waiting for the sun to rise, I don't think that's a Kavi Samaya. That's just something I imagined. I don't think, yeah, that's, so there has to be a balance between using your own imagination to create new situations and using Kavi Samayas. So ev using Kavi Samayas in every verse is not required. But at the same time, I feel that the scientific approach to Kavi Samayas is missing the point entirely. I mean, the whole point of Kavi Samayas is that it's an imaginative thing. So I think one of the things which is very common even in vernacular languages is when the clouds are there and it's about to rain, the peacocks dance. And this is there even in Hindi poetry, Hindi being the language I speak. So this is something very beautiful. That doesn't mean we go out when it's going to rain and use a camera, record the peacock. Is it dancing? I mean, that just misses the point. I think the point of Kavi Samayas is that it, it situates you within a tradition because these are imaginative constructs which are ancient uh, and poets used. But at the same time, you want to use them to say something new. So you don't want to just say the same thing. I think that's the tricky thing. So one of the famous Kavi Samayas is that this moon has a dark spot and uh, your face is like the moon. But then some poets say, no, it's better than the moon because your face doesn't have a dark spot. And then people for the next thousand years keep outdoing that and coming up with new things to say about the beloved's face and the moon's mark. So this is kind of amazing. I mean, for a thousand years, people come up with new things to say. And it's based on this Kavi Samaya and this imaginative idea that there's this deer-shaped mark, Mrugankam or Mrugankaha on, on the moon. So I think Kavi Samayas are uh, very, very important if you want to appreciate the kinds of things that Sanskrit poets found interesting about the world. So not everything was uh, essential. So one of the things, these Kavi Samayas shows the things they found really beautiful. So we can utilize them and then create something new out of these Kavi Samayas. Uh, and as far as the Ch Chandobadha poetry is concerned, I mean, since I study in Oxford, I feel that we need a combination of the Western and Indian approach because in the West, it's basically a dead language. They view Sanskrit that way. And they're just, they're just interested in what someone in 500 BC said, which is also interesting, but that's not the only purpose of life, I feel. Uh, so you want to utilize Sanskrit as a living thing, which is very uh, prevalent in India. So people still are related to Sanskrit uh, and still listen to Sanskrit mantras, hymns, and so on. Uh, as far as how I got inspired, so Suhas Mahesh, who I sh I'm sure all of you know, is at Oxford. So I got to meet him and he really encouraged me to write, even when I was, I started writing two, three years ago and I was writing really very mediocre stuff, I would say probably, but he was still always encouraging me to keep writing, always giving me feedback. In fact, all these verses I've written, I sent it to Suhas first and he gave me feedback about grammatical mistakes I might have made and the mistakes I might have made. So one of the things I found among Sanskrit speakers is that there's such a generosity of spirit that they're willing to give you the time to help you. And that has really helped me because he's such a great poet and I really enjoy reading whatever he writes. But he encouraged me. He didn't uh, make it seem like, oh, Sanskrit is this 3000 year old thing. It's so difficult and so on. But just try to write whatever you feel like. And I eventually practiced, practiced. And eventually, I think it's just a matter of reading good Sanskrit poetry and just practicing writing in meters. So the really important thing to write in meters is this uh, knowing these uh, knowing synonyms, basically, <laughs> because as Madhav, De Madhav Deshpande ji was saying, there are like a hundred ways of saying king, any word meaning protector of men. And sometimes you need three short syllables. So you come up with something or three short syllables, protector of men. Sometimes you need two heavy syllables. So you come up with two syllables, protector of men. So you need to have that creativity, which I think is very, makes Sanskrit quite different because when I, when you write in Hindi or English, you don't use a word which has never been used. I mean, most of the time it will be considered ungrammatical most of the time not always but in sanskrit you have to coin new words as long as they are established in this meaning so one of my favorites is the garment of the teeth means lips so this is like you you wouldn't know it unless you know it and any word meaning garment of teeth can mean lips so there are like 10 words for garment let's say 10 words 10 words for teeth there are 100 ways of saying lips in sanskrit automatically so this is part of the power of the language which i think is very unique and we should not be ashamed of it or shy of it and say that, oh, this is not there in other languages. Yeah, but okay, this is part of Sanskrit and what makes it unique, so, yeah. Thank you, thanks a lot. We have a question. So, um, we will now actually uh, formally open the floor for questions. So if any of you have any questions to ask to the poets or if the poets themselves have any suggestions, comments, questions to ask each other, please go ahead. If you can use the... Um, raising your hand item, then we can take questions. Otherwise, you can put it up in the chat box as well. And may I also request you to switch on your videos so that we can all see each other. This is a very intimate poet group, so why not we all see each other if that's possible? So, um, 
So I see one question from um, Sunil Kumar, which we will take first, and then uh, we can move on to more questions. So, uh, sir, uh, we are requesting you to unmute and go ahead. Right. Yeah, uh, my question was basically I published uh, an anthology of English language poetry two decades back, uh, but my question was for Mr. Sri Nahata. I just uh, started learning Sanskrit only a year back. So I, uh, he uh, clarified some elements in his previous answer, but I would uh, uh, like uh, some suggestions from him as to uh, making Sanskrit uh, part of uh, the mental mindscape because uh, fluency in a language uh, uh, only leads to a poetic expression and uh, Sanskrit has this elaborate uh, meter process, the chandas and all of that. So can a, like uh, in English, we have even have free verse and all of that. So can uh, those systems be applied to uh, Indic traditions, so to speak? Or uh, I just wanted uh, some uh, inputs from him on uh, 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 Sanskrit, uh, how to go about it. Yeah, I mean, it's a very difficult question and there's no one way. That's the most important thing to remember that everyone has their own way. Personally, I found that a little bit of memorization of your favorite verses helps. So if you want to learn how to use a meter or you want to learn, improve your vocabulary because the vocabulary of Sanskrit is vast. And even if you just read the dictionaries, it's like thousand pages and it could be a lifetime just reading the dictionary. So the best way is to start reading simple Ramayanam, Mahabharatam and so on. They are written in the simplest form of Sanskrit. Read the verses, read them slowly. Don't need to hurry. Don't need to read the entire thing. Read a small number of verses daily. Memorize the verses that you really like, because if you really like a verse, it is something that touches you and you want to make it part of yourself. So if you can memorize it, uh, that's one of the things I also see with Suhas and my own professor, Devaka Acharyaji, any situation they can recite a beautiful verse related to that situation. So when if you like some verses, memorize it as well. Uh, and I would say grammar is important. You can't really substitute grammar. You don't have to do it in the Parninian way. You can also do it in modern uh, Western ways. It depends on what you prefer. Uh, we, uh, uh, so uh, as, as far as uh, meters in English is concerned, so English meters are not applicable to Sanskrit. Firstly, okay, free verse is different. It's in a free verse, i.e. it's not written in a particular meter. But even if you go back to old English, like Shakespeare or whatever, they are writing in meters. But the principle of the meters in English is different. It's based on mora or weight, whereas the number of syllables is not fixed. So in the verses I've recited, every line has 19 aksharas and an akshara is defined as a vowel. So there are 19 vowels in each line in Shardula Vikridita, and that's a rule. And this is the principle of metrics in Sanskrit, whereas in Prakrit, the principle of metrics is closer to English because the number of syllables in each line is not fixed. The, the weight of the syllables, so to speak, the mora, uh, that's a technical term, is fixed. And so Prakrit meters are closer to English in that respect. Sanskrit meters are quantitative because the number of syllables is fixed. So all of this is technical stuff. I don't think you need to worry about it. The most important thing is to read uh, slowly, read Ramayana, Mahabharatam, uh, in, uh, whichever verses you like, memorize it and uh, really make it a part of yourself. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I think Anand sir has a question to Kalyani. So, so why don't you go ahead and ask her since we're all face to face here? Yeah, uh, you know, I really love the, the, the strength, the profundity with which uh, Kalyani ji writes. And I would like to uh, know more from her, the forms, the poetry forms that she uses. Like, uh, do you really uh, like go for the free verse for the stronger poems and maybe use meters and rhyming forms? And what are your favorite rhyme forms which you use for other poetry? Uh, well, um, yes, I do use free verse for uh, most of the poems that I want to make an impact on. Um, when it comes to serious uh, societal issues that I want to portray in a poem, I always use free verse. Um, that is actually because I was so inspired by Kamla Das. Uh, if you notice her poetry, 
she always writes in a free verse and it's just it, it's always inspired me to um, and, and it makes a lot of impact when you read it 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 goes straight to your heart it it's so impactful and uh, i got so inspired by it so i thought every time i want to make a difference or let other people know something i want to say something in a very serious tone i thought free verse is the way to go uh otherwise i do use rhyme schemes and uh, meters in certain poems but uh, most of them are romantic love poems and all that but uh, i've been focusing on free verse more these days than uh, rhyme schemes and meters yeah uh, free uh, verse in a way you know allows you the freedom to use whichever word so you use the best possible word or the strongest possible word which sometimes you might have to substitute uh, to fit in a certain meter or rhyme but uh, conventionally i write very simple and soft romantic poetry so i uh, you know it is very classical very romantic very poetry of a a b a or i like to write uh, ballads or like to use uh, you know uh, couplets so those are my favorite ones i like to play along with different ones it's it's very beautiful and i'm i'm almost envious because uh, most of the times rhyme scheme don't come easy to every writer and so we have to resort to free verses so that yeah. we can make a point <laughs> so, you know the the kind of poems which you write like i saw the ones which you had you know if you substituted word for a uh, with another word which just was there for the sake of its meter or for the sake of its rhyming it would dilute the content and would defeat yes. the purpose so yes. uh, you know yes. you're absolutely justified i also write sometimes free verse i write free verse when i write philosophical poems uh but i when it comes to conventional writing poetry uh, i just i i love the recitability the rhyme forms you know i love to sing my poem and that's what yeah. makes me stick to rhyme forms okay right. um I, go ahead kulani please go ahead no i, I was just saying that uh, i was always under the impression that poems had to rhyme all the time ever since i was in school we'd learn rhyming poems and um teachers whenever we wrote free verses most of the teachers would not feel comfortable with it um but then i reached a stage of my life and i had this amazing english teacher and uh, she told me like you don't always have to rhyme just relax go write whatever you want and i'm like okay fine we're allowed to do that i did know that and that's yeah. how i came up with the power of free verse actually actually writing poetry you know you it it gives you the liberty to uh, you know even uh, tweak your words you can make new words like uh, neologisms so to say i i use them quite uh, once in a while for example in my first poem i use the word mystici there is no word called mystici it is mystery but you know because it rhymes so i take the liberty to make it like that and you know it just fits so well uh, secondly don't really have to care much about grammar also so you know poetry is free verse you know what comes to your heart just put on paper don't worry about it okay uh, sanjana has a comment so uh, sanjana please go on hello hi thank you uh, a big thank you to all three poets uh, for sharing your work i um kind of got got me thinking quite a lot because and i just want to share like a like just a reflection i had about um a theme i found in all three of the poems and like a thread because my my brain i guess only thinks in like certain kinds of ways so i found as is is how each of the poet use like liquid because obviously sir um um anand sir had like the first poem about the jar and i felt so that your that your poem really helped us that poem about, about where you kind of um you wrote from the the point of the the, the droplet the the droplets really helped me think about time quite a lot because it i don't know there's a sense of you're losing time that you have to live your life and you know think about how you're living and this line like mindful i got about my being uh so i, I thought that was very um, striking and um kalyani your poem again it's like it's like different it's like a different manifestation or a different face of like the liquid because you talk about blood and i thought one of the things that i like really liked about your poem is the how you transitioned from being protected by your mother to to a sense of now i have to defend my mother and i think i don't know that, that transition was just so beautifully done but i also felt that even though you you said you just said that your poem was in free verse it was it reminded me a lot of like prose poetry and like the prose poetry 
style. I don't know if you've read one of the, it's like, it reminds me very much of like this piece by Jamaica Kincaid, like the um, African-American author who wrote a piece called Girl. And that is also about a relationship with her mother, but it's like written very much in like that prose poetry style that I found. Um, that is just so, I, I just felt like the flow was just very beautiful because I, I quite struggled to write in that kind of um, narrative style. And I thought that you like did that so kind of flawlessly. And I, I really liked that transition and I really liked the way that you use that prose poetry style. Um, and lastly, um, Nahata sir, like you spoke about the, the the your manif like the the li the liquid you were talking about was obviously was in the clouds and in the form of the raindrop, but the but the the line the the lines I I really found more striking was when you ask in in the the line you ask your the the line you ask your lover which which bird um which bird um am I in your heart uh, the one and I thought that was uh, really really beautifully done a very um, yeah, very beautiful. So I kept thinking about how each of the poems dealt with this, with just like, like liquid in like so many different ways and just made me think about that. And I still will continue thinking about that. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sandra. And yeah, so uh, we are almost uh, running short of time as well. So if you have more questions or comments, we will take them in the WhatsApp group. We will be open for all of your comments and suggestions and feedback. So, uh, Kalyani, if you would like to say something, yeah, please go ahead. Oh, uh, no, that was by accident. Sorry. Okay, okay, all right. Let's breathe to uh, make a formal word of thanks. Thank you so much, Meera. I think it was a beautiful session. I would first of all like to thank uh, today's poets, Dr. Anand Ahuja, Kalyani, and uh, Srinathaji Ji for sharing their wonderful work with all of us and all the participants present here. And I would like to thank uh, Professor Sangeeta Menon uh, for conceptualizing and giving us the space. Uh, she's the Dean and Head of Department at the School of Humanities uh, and the Na thanking National Institute of Advanced Studies for making this happen and supporting us every time. Uh, thank you so much, one and all. And our next session is on the 23rd of February. Uh, it's a Kavyala Vaisheshtya session on uh, poetry and sculpture by Arun Bharadwaj. Looking forward to uh, everyone attending the session. Thank you so much. Namaste. Thank you so much.